It's that time of year again when shopkeepers are trying to get us to buy gifts for other people, with the emphasis on not buying. And it makes people forget that the best gifts you can give are gifts of the spirit, gifts of the heart. Those things you don't give any particular season out of the year. They're meant to be given all the time. The gift of forgiveness, the gift of your knowledge, the gift of fairness, justice. The fact that we can give these gifts reminds us that we have a certain wealth in our hearts. We have more to share, more than we need, so that we can share. If we keep our mental energy up, if we keep our heart energy up. That's why the Buddha talked about what he calls the wealth of the noble ones, noble wealth which people who are not yet noble ones can also develop. It's one of the things we're doing right here. We're developing the strength inside so we can keep churning out all those gifts that we want to give to other people in terms of our time, our energy, our concern, our love, our compassion. And it's good to think about what those strengths are that strengthen these qualities that make us wealthy inside. The first is conviction. It starts out with conviction in the Buddha's awakening. He really did know what he was talking about. It really was through his own efforts that he found an awakening that's valid for everybody, everywhere, at all times. This past week I was reading some comments from people who were saying, well, you know, the Buddha didn't really appreciate sensual pleasures because, after all, he'd gone through all those austerities and it kind of warped his mind. implying that he didn't really know what he's talking about. And if you have that kind of attitude, then what are you going to take as an object of your conviction, aside from your own opinions? Now, the Buddha's awakening has meaning for us in the sense that it was through his own efforts that he was able to achieve a happiness that's beyond conditions. In other words, there were causes in the path that enabled him to find something that was uncaused. And the qualities that he developed along the path were things that we all have in greater or lesser measure already. There weren't any superhuman qualities. It was just that he took them and developed them all the way, which means that we can do that too. But again, it's a matter of our own efforts. It starts with generosity and goes through virtue and on into developing good qualities through meditation. And so if you think about these types of noble wealth as forms of investment, this is what you start out with. In any kind of investment, you have to make the decision, okay, I'm going to put aside something now that I can trust will pay back in the future. And you hear many times the idea that this is called spiritual materialism and you're trying to outgrow this. But it's where we all have to start. Without that conviction in our own actions. We're just going to keep looking for whatever pleasure we can find right now. In fact, that was the consequence in the Buddha's time. People who denied the principle of action, that your actions had any impact on anything, they tended to go toward hedonism. You find whatever pleasures you can right now, right now, because you don't know when you're going to die. Why give up a pleasure in the hand for something that's promised down the road? That was their attitude. But if you are convinced in the principle of action, that your actions do have consequences and they go really far down line, then you're going to be a lot more careful about what you're going to do, and you're going to be more willing to make sacrifices, to take the effort to develop these good qualities of mind. So conviction is what you have to start with. It's the principle of trust, that where you focus your efforts here on your own mind, you're focusing them in the right place, and you're not going to regret it. Built on that comes a cluster of three qualities. There's virtue shame and compunction. Virtue means holding to the precepts. Now, sometimes you hear that 
holding the precepts is a fetter. There, there's the word sila, bhatta, paramasa, which means grasping it, sila and vata. In other words, sila here can mean virtue or precept. It can also mean just habits in general. And it would be strange that if people held to good habits, it would be a fetter, but if they held to bad habits, it would not be a fetter. So I think the word sila there means habits in general. And it's holding to the idea of doing things a certain way and you're going to you obey the rules, or if you follow a certain pattern of behavior, that's going to be enough. Whereas for the Buddha, the, the precepts are means for training the mind, trying to develop more alertness, trying to develop more mindfulness, trying to get you to reflect on your actions and their consequences, and learning some restraint. Because if you don't have restraint, mindfulness, alertness, you're never going to be able to get anywhere in your meditation. So using the precepts is not a fetter. In fact, it's the way beyond fetters. And you find that all the training rules have their impact on the mind. The monks have more because as a group they have to depend on the support of lay people and the confidence of lay people. And we have to make sure that one monk doesn't try to garner all the support for himself take it away from others. So there are rules that govern the relationship between the monks and the lay people and between the monks and the monks. And those are all important parts of the training, too. As the Buddha said, these are all for cleansing away the defilements of the mind. So again, it's using precepts as a tool rather than as an end in and of themselves. That's what we're working on here. And it is a form of wealth. You're restraining, you're refraining yourself from doing the kinds of things you want to do just because you feel like doing them. You start thinking about the consequences. And virtue here is supplemented by shame and compunction. Shame here is not so much being ashamed of yourself as a bad person, being being ashamed of certain actions, seeing that they're beneath you, and that you don't want to get involved. Compunction is thinking about the consequences of the actions down the line, realizing you want to avoid anything that's going to cause trouble. All these qualities acting together are priceless. Because if you refrain from making mistakes, there are a lot of mistakes you make that just stick in the memory. I'm reading about the veterans of wars who find themselves at night thinking about the people they killed. The one guy said, I'd give a million dollars in order to wipe out those memories, not or could go back and not have done that. Well, if you avoid making the mistake from begin to begin with, then you don't have to have those memories. You don't have to be burdened by them and wish you had gone were able to go back. That ability to refrain from evil is, as I said, is priceless, worth more than a million dollars. Because you don't have to have the regret that would eat away at the heart. So it's these qualities that hold you back. These are a form of wealth. So it's good to appreciate them, that they are wealth in the mind. The other three qualities are learning, generosity, and discernment. Learning here is learning about the Dharma having this to fall back on. I remember the year, especially the first year after John Fuang passed away, there was a lot of jockeying for power in the monastery, and a lot of strange things happening, people coming in from outside trying to take over, and having to deal with all kinds of difficulties. And it was during that time that different things that John Fuang had said while I was with him would suddenly come to mind. That was my guidance. That's what saw me through that year and for the remaining years. In fact, that was the beginning of the book, Awareness Itself. I realized I didn't want to forget these things. These were principles that helped see me through the difficulties of those times. And so it's good to read the Dharma. Have that as your wealth, something to remind you as you 
go through life and you get tempted to do something you shouldn't do or you don't feel strong enough to do something you should. Those words are words of encouragement, words that help you get your priorities straight. Because that's an important part of the Dharma teaching, was just seeing what is really important. It's like with the Four Noble Truths. It's not just a casual truth. Oh, these are four things that are useful to know about suffering, among all the other things you could know. The Buddha is basically saying, these are the most important issues you want to focus on. The question of what you're doing to cause suffering and what you can do to put an end to it. If you give priority to these issues, everything falls into place. So learning is a form of wealth. It gives you the guidance you need when your own discernment isn't up to firing shots in rapid succession and piercing grace masses and shooting long distances. In other words, when it's not quick enough, when it can't see far enough down the line, and when it can't break through this big mass of ignorance in your mind, the learning you've gotten can help you in that direction. As for generosity, this is a quality of mind that makes your own mind spacious. In other words, if you're able to give something, and if it's not material things, you can give your time, you can give your knowledge, you can give your help to other people, give your energy. You can give fairness. They talk about the gift of Dharma, which means both teaching other people the Dharma as you can, being a good example in the Dharma, and at the same time being fair, showing justice to other people. These are really important gifts, much more important than anything material you might be able to give somebody. It goes deeper in the heart, but it's not something you just do on one day. It's something you try to do all year round. But when you give things like this, you begin to realize that your heart is broad. It's very roomy. It's a good place to live. If you're living in a very narrow heart that doesn't want to help anybody and you know, is afraid that if you give this away, then you're going to lack it down the line. That's like living in a tiny, tiny little room. You have, hardly have any room to move at all. But when you're generous, as St. John Lee says, the sky is your, your roof, the ground is your floor, every house is your house. In other words, the world is your place because you've been helping the world. And there's a lot of room in that mind. And then finally, discernment. This is when you learn to go beyond just what you've learned from other people or heard from other people, and you can start producing your own wisdom, your own insights as you need them. I made reference just now to the, what they call the three skills of the archer that the Buddha used to compare with discernment to fire shots in rapid succession. In other words, you're quick. You see something and you can see right through what the issue is, particularly issues in your own mind. You shoot great distances. In other words, you know that if you do this, these are going to be the consequences that are going to follow down the line. And to pierce great masses, that's the mass of ignorance. This is a quality that's a real wealth. Because as John Lee says, if you have discernment, then all you need is a knife. He's talking about a machete. And you can just set yourself up in business wherever you happen to be. In other words, you don't need many tools. You just For them, in Thailand, the basic tool was your machete. But if you have discernment, you can use it for all kinds of things. You learn to use your ingenuity, your own powers of observation. Look what John Lee did with the breath. The text gave just a few basic ideas, and he was able to run with it and develop a very detailed course for how you work with the breath energy in the body, how you make it a really good place to be. How you can get the mind into right concentration just by the way you focus on your breath. Of course, he had the example of the Buddha before him. Again, the Buddha used the breath, something we all have. Everybody breathes in, breathes out all the time. It's not like the Buddha had to go search up into the Himalayan mountains and find some rare root or something. He was able to just focus on something that's right there all the time. But because of his discernment, he was make, able to make a lot out of it. That's the wealth of discernment. 
You don't need a lot of resources, but you can take what you've got and you can turn them into wealth. So these are forms of inner wealth that strengthen the mind, so that you can be a more giving person, giving in your dealings with other people. An open-handed person, as the Buddha says. And this kind of wealth, when you share it, it really is a gift. It's a gift that comes from the heart and goes to the heart. So invest as much time and energy in developing this kind of wealth, and you're not going to regret it.